welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House U.S. to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode five, Royal Reason of Relativity, Buddha, Einstein, and Wittgenstein. I've been thinking about Einstein and about nuclear fission and atomic bombs and the Death Star and the idea that ordinary matter has within it total self-destruct possibility. It can just fissionize. And there's so much power in like any kind of ordinary atom. Chain reaction, right? What that means is like that solid pillar, this building, if someone dropped a bomb a block or two away, the seemingly very, very stable atoms in this building would release the strong force inside of them and the weak force of whatever. I can't explain it exactly. I'm not a physicist, unfortunately. I missed my calling. But there, there would be this huge release of energy from within this seemingly, like, look, solid walls, paintings, people. And from within these atoms, it would all completely vaporize. Totally. Do you realize that? Now, how did that happen? How can that happen? How does that happen? That's what I've been thinking about all day. And of course, we think, oh, somebody <coughs> discovered they took some plutonium and they put it in a trigger mechanism and they made a little metal box and they had it blow up with this and they maybe, I don't know, started with dynamite and then that did the plutonium and then that did this and did that. But wasn't it originally the idea? Of, of general and special relativity. And the idea of the basic instability and the relative, relative, relativism of everything. And that sort of light, you know, light is, speed of light, right, is, remains a kind of seeming absolute in Einstein's theory because at the speed of light, matter becomes, mass becomes infinite. So therefore, there's no more motion, you know. And therefore, in a way, it's impossible. Uh, any one atom becomes infinite, or a subatomic particle becomes infinite. At that's past that speed, supposedly. And uh, which is kind of an interesting idea, since there's all these little atoms, and then any one of them, if it became, if it went at the speed of light, and then there's all these particles of light here, like even electric light, sunlight. And they're all just short of infinite. So what was the idea that there could be this spontaneous combustion within the stable atoms? See, you know, the, the hard atoms everybody had been thinking about for thousands of years in Europe. Although it was predicted by Buddha 2,500 years ago against this, most of the Indians at the time had hard atoms too. The Vaisheshika school was a physicist school and they had hard atoms. Because the idea that this hard stuff has to be made out of some building blocks that are sort of ultimate hard stuff is a natural one. It, you know, it's natural, like, you know, that's hard. You know? It seems hard, so that, and it seems real as it is in itself to us, right? So therefore, we make a theory about it like that. So I've been thinking about this all day. Like, what would happen if an A-bomb went off, like, at the Met House? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what would it be like? Like every one of us, we have like on our cheeks and ears, we have nice atoms that are like behaving themselves, <laughs> holding up our earrings or like whatever, why is holding my hearing aid, you know? They're all nice and then suddenly they're like, <laughs> just like, whoosh, the heat beyond the sun and the pillar will go, and the rebar inside the pillar, and metal beams and everything, just like whoosh. What does that mean? And then the thought of this could happen if such and such 
energies were to approach all ordinary stable atoms in such and such a way. What is that thought in the mind of Einstein? Transcendent wisdom is our topic today. And the key expression is matter is voidness and voidness is matter. Matter is not other than voidness and voidness is not other than matter. You know, people used to say form is emptiness and emptiness is form. And then nobody knew what it meant. Because form is sort of some vague thing. You know, maybe some Platonists think it's some sort of idea thing in some heaven. You know, the idea, the idea, the idos, the, the pure form, you know. And uh, others think form is like a shape or something. So form is emptiness. Well, I guess so. You know, emptiness is form. But matter, that is a different matter, right? Matter. Matter is voidness. And I prefer voidness because emptiness is not wrong, of course. Form is wrong, actually. Although everyone has translated it like that. But it is really wrong. Because the word rupa in Sanskrit, suk in Tibetan, has two contexts, main contexts. It has others, but two main ones. And one of them is as a visual object. And there, form and color, it's defined as form and color. And that's where the form translation comes from, although I think it comes from 19th century British people who'd grown up on Plato, Socrates, and the idea of the pure forms, you know. And uh, that's one of its contexts. But the other context is the, is the body, the physical, the physical. You know, the body, you know, gra earth, water, fire, wind, physical things. And that's not form, that's matter. You know, there's not a necessarily, some form is not a visual object. Some matter, rather, some suk, some rupa. It's, a, it's matter, material, right? So it's much more contradictory and shocking to say, from what we expect, to say matter is voidness and voidness is matter. Now, don't look baffled. Every single one of you tonight is going to understand this before we leave this room. <laughs> You say, because it's very simple. I mean, I'm not really claiming any great thing. It's really quite simple. What voidness means is not nothingness. Now, in the old days, a lot of translators, too, like big scholars, Europe and everything, they would translate shunyata, the word shunyata, which you could also translate as zero-ness. <clears throat> they would translate it as nothingness. But there is a word in Sanskrit, abhavatva, or nastitva. There's several words for nothingness, non-existentness. And this is not one of them. This is emptiness. Emptiness is still a relational word. Voidness is a relational word. Something is void of something else, right? So it's a negation, voidness. Actually, even the word freedom is a negation. Do you realize that? We all love freedom. Nobody's scared when you say freedom, supposedly. Although Eric Fromm said people are scared of freedom, actually, and they rush for authorities and structures and things. But um, but uh, freedom is actually a negation. It means freedom from something. You know, we say salt-free, sugar-free, trouble-free, whatever, confusion-free. Free means not there. It's like trouble-less, sugar-less, you know, same, less, free, right? But when we say freedom, we think, oh, that's great. I like that. But we don't know where it leads, of course. So voidness is a word like that. Zero-ness, zero, zero, it's like, it's analogous to space, but it isn't space, only analogous to space. But and space is the best analogy for it. What is everything that he says no, and everything here that he says no eye, you think you have eyes, no ear, no nose, you think you have a nose, I think I have a nose, I don't, don't just not be personal, I think I have a nose, it says no nose. No nose means that my nose is not, it's real, relatively real. It's real, I, it's there when I don't look for it too, with too fine tooth a comb, when I don't try to pinpoint what it ultimately is. Because ultimately, I can't find my nose. Anything that you have, you can't find it ultimately. You can find it relatively. And you, if you don't look too hard for it, and you don't look at all for it, as I would say, I like to do the nose because everybody's nose is their lifelong hood ornament. <laughs> you know, in the old days, cars had hood ornaments, you know, and you'd drive along with your hood ornament, like going through space, you know. 
So your nose is the hood ornament. You are looking out and seeing something, but you're, you're looking past your nose. So naturally, you assume it's there. But if you look really hard for your nose, what are you going to find? Touch any part of your nose, and it could be removed, and you'd still have a nose. You know, any point on your nose is not on your nose, because a point has no size, and therefore it doesn't exist. It's just an abstraction, x, y. A dot is not a point. Any dot you put on your nose, you could take that piece of skin off, and you still have a nose. At some point, what would be the last dot you would take off your nose where then you wouldn't have a nose? You can't really say. If you're taking off pieces of your nose, then you get down, now, now you're taking off your cheek. But what is now? Where is the line for now? Or then go, and we are very lucky in modern times because we have quantum physics, popularly understood and sort of, we know that they're like, physicists are going crazy trying to find something they can hold on to which they haven't been able to. They did advertise in the newspapers that they found the Higgs boson last summer, and it's all over the newspapers. Well, the secret of volume is the Higgs boson. They were nearly going berserk with joy. But if you read any of the articles, it said, well, but the Higgs boson, it said, was an explosion in this cyclotron, and then there was something else happened in the mass. So from that, based on a model and this theory and that mathematics, we assumed that was a Higgs boson. Then we never found no Higgs boson. They didn't find the Higgs boson. Like, here's the Higgs boson. No way. <laughs> it's a huge bunch of inferences. And then they were caveats of up a storm. Oh, yeah, but mostly it's held up in some dark matter and dark energy, which is 97% of the universe between them. 70% is the matter or the energy, and 27% is the matter or vice versa. I forget. But they don't even know what that is. They have no idea because it's dark. You can't see it. It's also only inferred. It's like the ether. It's just like there's something in their imagination, actually. <laughs> they have no idea. So that's very good for us, because then we can say, well, any, even any particle in my nose, if the quantum people got my nose and threw it in a cyclotron, it would disappear under their analysis. There might be some explosions, some traces, some statistics, but they couldn't find it. They wouldn't find my nose. That would be it for my nose. It would disappear under analysis. 2,600 years ago, the Buddha said, that's the case. The Pranaparamita Sutra is saying that's the case. It's not that bad a problem, actually. It's actually a good thing. It's not to be frightened. No, this, no, that is not a frightening thing. Because what it means is, no means no intrinsically real knows. No independently self-subsistent knows. There's a lot of ways. No intrinsically identifiable knows. No intrinsically referential knows. The word knows does not land in a particular place. It sort I mean, it lands sort of generally. But, you know, every, it, the nose is constituted by many things which are not the nose. It's a conventional object. It's an arbitrarily... It's conceptually constructed by name and concept. That's what makes it what it is. And therefore, its, its status of being what it is is purely relational. Not any kind of a nose in itself. There is no nose in itself. This is really, really liberating, actually. It's not bad. If, you, if your nose really knew that, it would be relaxed. As you grow old and it starts crumbling down your face, you wouldn't necessarily freak out that you don't, <laughs> that you don't have that, that pert little nose of 16 anymore. It's kind of like drooping down. You wouldn't rush off like poor Michael Jackson and have some, bar, some barbarian like chop it up and like, I don't know what they did to the poor guy. Because you wouldn't be looking for that absolute nose. There is no such thing. Now, then the question only becomes, Big deal, we know everything is relative, supposedly. We think we do, right? It's all relative, but we, that's not the case. Actually, we have what's called an intrinsic reality habit, an intrinsic objectivity habit, an intrinsic identity habit, an intrinsic self habit, all of these things. That is, 
you feel, unless you're enlightened, then I never worry about you if you're enlightened. Nothing can bother you. So I'm just saying you in general. And I include me and you, don't worry. I don't pretend to it. But it means that, like, if I lose my temper, if something really presses my button, then I have an emotion. And that emotion feels like an absolute thing to me. And it makes me do all kinds of things that I didn't want to do, as if I was under the control of some sort of absolute thing that I can't resist, that impulse. Did you ever have experience like that? <laughs> Where you just had to do this or that? If you're mad, it's bad because then you always hurt things. Yourself, others, break things. You know, that's when you're most reckless. But, you know, lust, obsession, and depression can be really bad too. You get closed all in and completely like isolated away from the universe, all alone in some absolute aloneness. And people can kill themselves, actually. They get so completely reckless with their own being. They would do what normally they wouldn't do. Do you, know, you understand what I'm saying? This is called, in the great psychology tradition founded by the Buddha, this is called the intrinsic reality habit. I think I mentioned it last time. That pillar, or this wall, it seems to have its own intrinsic objectivity about it. You, when you see it, you feel like your perception is meeting its massive facticity. <laughs> My favorite sociology of knowledge term by Peter Berger and such kinds. It has a massive factuality and objectivity about it. It's like real wall, right? It couldn't, how can that be if it, they blew up an atom bomb in this room and it became like a seething inferno? from within its own self. How could that happen? Since it's massively just a concrete wall. So we have this intrinsic objectivity. There's three levels of this. I'll tell you right away. It's like a top advanced secret thing. Intrinsic reality is sort of having to do with our more, more less subtle kind of thought that something's exists, what they call ontology in philosophy. You know, it's just the beingness of the thing. It has its intrinsic reality. Like reality means it's really real, right? So, and it's intrinsic. The reality is intrinsic to it. It isn't an ascribed reality, just a relational reality, just a circumstantial reality. It's intrinsic. The reality comes out of the essence of the thing. The early Wittgenstein, great Viennese Jewish philosopher who showed the British a thing or two, who was also trained to be an engineer, but then became a philosopher because the British were staggering around trying to hold on to their empire. And he like let them, and he was in the trenches where then he tried to do better than them, finding sort of some absolute notation that would control the simples, the irreducible objects that constitute reality in the British imperial view. And he wrote the Tractatus Philological Philosophicus. But then he thought about it for a while back in Vienna and Austria, and he realized how ridiculous that was. And he realized that there is no intrinsic reality to anything. And he wrote the Philosophical Investigations, which brought, brought, uh, brought the West right, right up to the transcendent wisdom. But unfortunately, he didn't have any colleagues who knew that. So he sort of was a little bit lonely. You know? And then people still are freaked out about him in academic philosophy departments. The leader, Wittgenstein, did he freak out? Was he a hippie? Was he gay? What happened? Did he go to the movies too many times or what? Because <laughs> he keeps saying that there's no way to pin things down. And uh, he, he had a, an encounter with a guy called G.E. Moore, who was like this in the class, like, I know that's my hand. That hand is really there. And Wittgenstein said, no, it isn't. You can't know that. You don't know that's your hand. It's not your hand. It's invisible, that hand. <laughs> and somehow it dissolved under, because Wittgenstein realized it dissolves under analysis, the hand. And down to every atom. He wasn't a physicist either. Although the physics people already in 1926, before that, had already discovered the fact that you can't pin down what they call deep reality. You cannot find a particle, which Einstein wouldn't agree with. So. Uh, that's really, 
deep. There's something deep. The royal reason of relativity means that this is it. That's just it. That feeling, the apodictic, is it, or the deictic feeling of at least I have this, or like that guy G.E. Moore in, in struggling with the enlightened Wittgenstein. He's going, this is my hand, I know this. this. Don't tell me I don't know this in my hand. He's going, <laughs> there's a book, you can read it, it's called Uncertainty, you should read it, that Moore is going berserk. <laughs> he gets so mad, Wittgenstein gets under the table in this seminar room there at Cambridge. And so the feeling of this is it, it's, the irrationality puts a stop to it because you're reasoning. Because the highest meditation takes concentration of one pointness and connects it to the royal reason of relativity. And therefore sees through things. You develop x-ray vision through reasoning. That's true science. That is why these people were the real, that's why it says the Prajna Paramita, the mantra of great science, the great science. Because the great science is the scientists who accepted that their subjectivity is part of the universe and really looked into the subjectivity and saw through it. Didn't even stop with Descartes and say, well, I'm thinking about it, so I know that I'm thinking about it. Can't doubt that I'm doubting. Yes, you can. Your doubting self will disappear, too, if you really twist and turn on it with a, with a level of concentration that is beyond somebody sitting like that with that kind of posture. It's not a yogin. A true scientist is a yogin. And the scientists of this next generation will all be yogins, by the way. I'm not giving up on scientists. I love them. They're great. They're lab. They're yogis. You know the professor of the yogi, professor physicist, who was a true yogi at Columbia? He was famous. He had his pair of snowshoes in his lap, hanging on the wall. Do you know this one? No? He had his snowshoes hanging on the wall. He would come into the lab, he'd put them on, and clump around between the, between the lab tables. You know? The graduate students have to get out of the way of not being stepped on by the snowshoes. <laughs> Finally, one courageous graduate student, a woman, of course, they were more courageous, said, Professor, why are you clumping around this lab with the snowshoes? And he said, because when I get in the lab, my mind goes into the, into the unperceptibility of matter and the infinite divisibility of quantum level matter. And so I'm increasing my chances of not falling through into the subway. <laughs> <laughs> because he had had some experience of seeing the non-existence of the floor. His concentration and his thought experiment and his theory was something he was personally doing and taking responsibility for his own mind. You follow me? The scientists who pretend there's no subjectivity and they're going to win on their materialistic reductionism because they have all the money and the grants. Because some fool thinks that the nuclear bomb was set off by a mechanism. In fact, it was set off by the mind of the quantum physicists and the relativity theorists. That's where it happened. The divisibility of the matter, and the fact that atoms had this infinite energy in them, so-called atoms and subatomic particles, was occurred in the mind, and then they just made a mechanism to fit and to trigger it. But the trigger was their understanding, actually. And the fools think that, oh, that's nothing to do with it. It's just somebody stumbled on a mechanism, some guy tinkering in a garage. No way. He saw that. Einstein did, but he freaked out by it. God does not play dice, he said. I met Einstein, did I tell you about it? I'll tell you about it. So, but these are the following false views, that rationality does not put a stop to all perception controlled by the mental construction such as this is it. That means that the big itness experience that you may have, even in deep meditation, if your subjectivity is part of the equation, then your responsibility of creating it, you become aware of. And then you have to take responsibility of that. And rationality enables you to do that. The royal reason of relativity. Because your, oh, your unenlightened and uneducated perceptual habit is that I'm a thing in myself and the object is a thing in itself. And there's, at some level, there's no connection. I can withdraw into my thing in itself, my absolute separate self, and that thing has its own inaccessible pure idea, pure form. Pure essence, pure indivisible particle in it. 
You follow me? This is our reification habit pattern. And rationality can put a stop to that. That means it can break us through it. Second, that's one view that you'll understand when you understand that the re realistic worldview someone has seen through, seen there in some level there's, there's a non-existence, the objective non-existence of things is as objective as their existence. And that balances then the exaggerated, even though they haven't yet been broken through viscerally, which is not, the visceral breakthrough is not the experience of it not existing. The experience of it not existing is putting a, a counterweight to the experience of it as objectively existing as a thing in itself. It then seems to be a non-thing in itself, and they press together. And then this, this makes it possible then to find a truly relational way of dealing with it, where you are completely interrelated with it, if you follow me. The, it's like a tightrope walker. A tightrope walker is not in too good a shape if they're holding the pole straight up, like right over the rope and trying to like act like they're just directly over the rope so that make them unable to fall. Then they're very vulnerable to falling. This tiny thing cannot correct. So instead they take a big pole that weights at two ends, far out there, and then, they, then that balances so that they can do with fuzzy, fuzzy walking, fuzzy logic, they can move relationally on that, on that rope. You follow? Or a surfer, if a surfer tries to be like, I'm gonna stay upright here no matter what, bam, they're gonna get trounced. Second, the view that all practices before the generation of the authentic view, such as cultivation of the will to enlightenment, are but truth habits or sign habits. So this is the kind of person who says, this is the kind of view that we have. Well, until I get enlightenment or some deep in insight, then something like being morally good or meditating love and compassion or cultivating a will to enlightenment or trying to figure, correct my world, all different weird, strange ideologies it will do no good. So I won't bother with them until I get this, until I have a deep satori experience. And that will be put a stop to by understanding that all three things are there. So that in a way, what that means is that sort of it becomes you get to the, the, my famous slogan, Buddha is as Buddha does. So even though you don't feel that enlightened, and when someone wants a dollar from you on the street, you feel that this is really my dollar, this person is really crack addict, and they're not going to be any good with it, and I couldn't give it to all of them, and, and so that's useless, and I'm, it's really useless, and all of these concepts. And then, wait a minute, Giving a dollar is a chance to give something. And breaking past one's own rigid ideologies, somehow doing something unsurprising oneself, and here's the dollar, whatever you do with it. Now, it's not my business even, whatever. And I don't even congratulate myself. It just sort of happens. Not perceiving myself as the giver, the gift as a gift, the receiver as the receiver, the virtue of giving, none of it, just, it just uh, flows. Provided by Tenzin Chogel. Used with the artist's permission, all rights reserved. To learn more, visit TenzinChogel.com. This podcast is made through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To 
to learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. For a complete listing of all upcoming Robert Thurman events, please visit bobthurman.com. And for upcoming events in the heart of the Catskills in Phoenicia, New York at Menla, please visit menla.us, located just two hours north of New York City.